have one planet Earth. Nature is the basis of all species. That's why we would like to discuss how to reduce the environmental impact of research. So stick around and let's work on more sustainable science together. Welcome to Curious! Welcome to Curious and thank you for joining. My name is Michael Kaczynski. For those of you who are joining the first time, we have created Curious to be an interactive format to broadcast and to share ideas, activities, initiatives, but most importantly, to get your guys' feedback. The show or the format can actually cover various topics. They can be very technology oriented or they can have a broader scope, such as today's topic, which is sustainability. Now, let's have a sneak preview. Episode two of Curious, pure infotainment. Shape the future, honestly ambitious, taking all odds into account. Curious about the more sustainable lab of today? Practical eco-friendlier lab practices and how to reduce waste from packing to products. Let's stay curious. Welcome back. As I said, we want this to be a very interactive thing, so we have prepared the options to ask questions for you and to set up polls where we want to ask questions and we actually want to have your thoughts and input. Um, so now let's start into the topic of today. Um, I want to welcome my colleague Angelica, who made it on time out of the way from the jungle. So welcome, Angelica. Hi, Michael. I'm still a little bit hot. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Good. So let's dive into the topic, sustainability. I mean, that's a very big topic. It's on everybody's mind. Um, it's very emotionally debated. And obviously, we as a company have an obligation. So you are in the driver's seat for coordinating the activity when it comes to all the activities, when it comes around sustainability at Kyogen. So tell me, how did you approach this big thing? Yeah, sure. Obviously, I'm not the only one who's responsible. Mm -hmm. I am leading global sustainability projects, but it's a joint effort with 6,000 Kai engineers. Right. And um, as you know, we committed publicly to net zero mm -hmm. until 2050. And to be honest, when I started my position end of 2021, it was a little bit overwhelming. Yeah. There are so many great ideas from our customers, from our employees. So um, we discussed where to start for a while. But then we said, come on, guys, let's not wait until the plan is perfect. Let's just start. OK, so I assume you have to slice and dice this into a somewhat digestible and addressable portion. So how did you concretely approach this? Okay. Yeah, definitely. That's right. So we estimated and also analyzed our carbon emission footprint. Mm -hmm. And as always, um, the largest contribution to mm -hmm. emissions comes from our purchase goods and services. Oh, By really? the way, this okay. is um, also the same for us as private persons. Mm -hmm. So when you consume, you are impacting emissions. Right. So what we saw is that obviously plastics in our industry has mm -hmm. a big impact and mm -hmm. we spoke with our suppliers mm -hmm. and discussed and analyzed in more detail mm -hmm. which materials we um, possibly can exchange, reduce. Right. So it's really going into an active dialogue with also the companies who supply us with raw material, half-finished goods. I think that's a very important aspect of the whole exactly. thing. Exactly. And also leading to cooperation projects and mm -hmm. you will hear a little bit more about okay. that later. Yeah. Interesting to see. Obviously, plastic, raw material is one area, but there are obviously other areas as well, right? Like definitely, definitely. I mean, we have two, two larger plants in mm -hmm. Germantown and Hilden, mm -hmm. and here we are consuming electricity, right. gas. So um, also not really sophisticated. Uh, mm -hmm. We decided to transfer to green electricity in our mm -hmm. plants in Hilden and Germantown. Mm -hmm. Now um, making up around 70% wow. of our electricity. Is already green. So now I assume, and you will come to this, it's a, I think from a you know, household perspective, I mean, people have solar panels on their home, but usually that is not sufficient to you know, cover the whole energy consumption, so it's always a mixture. And then we in, engage in uh, supply plans with external vendors, and they tell us, okay, this is green energy. How can we make sure that the energy is actually green? Yeah, yeah. you're giving me a hard Sorry, time. Sorry, my intention. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's fair, okay. and it's a good question. So mm -hmm. we ask for certificates, mm -hmm. so you really need to get a document being signed mm -hmm. and proving that the electricity right. is green and for example the electricity in Germantown mm -hmm. is from wind parks okay. but 
obviously there is not enough green electricity. Right. And so it's even better if you produce your electricity by yourself and you install solar panels. So that's mm -hmm. what we did in Hilden and we also plan to do it in Germantown. Great. So again, as usual in life, it's never the always one fits perfect solution. Um, it's a mixture and we're going in the right direction. So I think that's a very good step. Now I think it would already be time to you know, involve our audience and ask the first questions around this big topic of sustainability and what does it mean for you in your professional life. So we prepared a poll um, where we ask the question, what exactly comes to your mind? What is the one word when you think about sustainability in your professional environment in the laboratory? Michael, as long as we are waiting for the answers, what do you think about diving a little bit deeper yep. into what sustainability means in professional lives? Absolutely, let's do so. So we had the pleasure and the chance to work with a real expert in this field. Her name is Mrs. Herbert Kleinschmidt. She consults laboratories and organizations, um, and a real expert, and we're very happy that we had the chance to talk to her. So let's have a look. Lab work has a huge environmental impact and the lab buildings alone consume three to five times more energy and water than a normal office building. Why is that so? Lab buildings have a high ventilation demand and about 66% of the whole energy is due to, to this high ventilation demand. And just to give you an idea, um, if you have a 100 square meter lab, you have to exchange about 3,000 cubic meters of air in every hour. All air has to be treated. It has to be humidified or dried. It has to be warmed or it has to be cooled. And then we have the fumes in the lab, which are connected to this ventilation system. Labs consume a lot of energy because lab work has to be safe. We need a high air exchange rate in the lab to prevent the accumulation of pollutants and of hazardous substances. Also, we need good, comfortable working conditions. What does this mean? We need a specific humidity in the lab, so between 35 to 55 percent and a specific temperature range, so between 18 to 24 degrees in the lab. We need these specific working conditions because otherwise it impedes your concentration and in the end the safe work in the lab. Also fume hoods use a lot of energy but we need them because they protect the researchers when they work with toxic substances. Labs consume a lot of energy also in their daily operations the instruments in the labs account for about 20% of the overall energy consumption. And it's not only about energy in the lab, it's also about other resources, for example, water. You need about three to five liter of tap water to produce one liter of purified lab water. So, how will the sustainable lab in the future look like? Well, first of all, bad news because we won't have a 100% sustainable lab in the future. Because, for example, we will always have to use plastics in the lab for specific applications. But perhaps we can reduce the amount of plastic that we are using and then generating less plastic waste. The sustainable lab in the future will run with renewable energies. For sure, we will also have more miniaturization and more automation in the lab. Miniaturization helps you to save resources. Automation helps you to prevent errors, to have accurate and reproducible results. I'm also sure that digitalization will have entered the lab. It has already today, but I think in the future we will have a real smart lab with interconnected workflows. I am also sure that we will use more artificial intelligence, for example, to predict models, like we've already seen the prediction of protein structures. 
last but not least, if you would like to implement sustainability in your lab work, you really have to implement it into your organization. You have to implement it in a systematic approach and in the end, lab work has to become part of your lab management, like you're having a safety management in the lab. If you would like to bring change into the life sciences, then you need two things. On the one hand, you need companies that provide ecologic and sustainable products. And on the other side, you have to support the people in the lab working more sustainable. And my aim is to help both. Welcome back. That was a very interesting video and we're more than happy that today we have the chance to talk to Mrs. Hermit Kleinschmidt directly and ask some questions. So a very warm welcome, uh, Mrs. Hermit Kleinschmidt. It's great to have you here today. Yeah, thank you. And I'm also happy to be part of the Curious right. Show today. Hello, Mrs. Hermut Kleinschmidt. Also a very warm welcome from my end. Thanks for joining. As we saw, you consulted already quite a few labs in getting more sustainable. What are the typical challenges the labs are facing? So one typical challenge is really the questions, where shall we start? Mm -hmm. So what are things that we can do? And my recommendation in this case is really to start with easy things. Mm -hmm. For example, to rethink your routines. And for example, when you're entering the lab in the morning, what are the first thing that, are, that you are doing? Are you putting on, for example, the heating block because you need it some time during the day? Or do you know the heating time and can adjust it um, and turn it only on when you really need it? Mm -hmm. The second thing is about experiments. So people are saying, okay, we cannot change our methods because they are established. And here again, my recommendation is to look into the process itself and perhaps there is a step which you can miniaturize mm -hmm. and already here again you can save some resources right. um, yeah and a third thing is really also the turnover in the lab so when the people that are really enthusiastic about sustainability when they leave the lab um, what is happening with the whole group and mm -hmm. their initiative stem so my recommendation is really to have kind of a green lab guy who is responsible for this mm -hmm. I think that's a very important point to, to have a go-to person, but at the same time also reconsidering all the processes and routines we are we're in every day. You mentioned in the context of um, plastic specifically, as far as I remember, the, the five R's. So maybe you can again tell us what these five R's are and maybe you have one example. Yeah, the five R's, it, it is um, reduce, mm -hmm. reuse, recycle, mm -hmm. replace and rethink. Okay. And one example is, for example, reduce. So um, if you're using, for example, 10 ml of a buffer, mm -hmm. um, what kind of tube are you using? Are you using a 50 ml tube? Uh, right. So just reduce it and you've already saved some plastics. That's obviously a very good idea, something so, easy to, to do, right? I agree. So there's really something we can do, right? We just have to start. Um, so Samuel Kleinschmidt, thinking a little bit outside the box, outside the lab, so to say, what else can we do? So one thing is really travel. So travel has mm -hmm. a huge impact and a lot of researchers are obviously traveling to meetings and conferences to exchange, which is really very important. But um, I think you really have to think about which conference to attend. And I have an example from the European Astronomical Society. So they've compared an on-site event, which they had in 2019, um, with an online event in 2020. And um, in the on-site event, they had about 1,240 participants and they generated 1,855 tons of carbon dioxide. And at the online event, they had more participants and they only had a carbon impact of 582 kilograms of carbon dioxide. Mm. Yeah. And I think this is really, yeah, very impressing. No, absolutely. And if, if there, I think if there's one thing which Corona did go to us, it's probably the build-up of the 
infrastructure which allows us to have exactly these virtual meetings. So thank you so much again for your time. That was really helpful, really insightful and stay safe. All the best. Talk to you soon. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Goodbye. Yeah. Goodbye. And thanks a lot. Good. So we heard about already processes, little things in the lab, um, but also <laughs> I think it's very important that our people are actively engaging um, in outside work activities to supporting their communities when it comes to the whole topic of being more environmental friendly. And I think we will have some very nice examples of how engaged our people are. Let's have a look. Why is sustainability important for me? And I would rather turn the questions to how can it not be important for me? Sustainability is especially important to me in the lab. Lab work generates large amounts of plastic waste and uses a lot of resources. While it might be challenging, there are measures uh, we can take to make our routines more sustainable. So be a busy bee. Every little bit counts. Sustainability is a super important topic for me. I've changed my shopping habits. I ride the bike more often than I use my car nowadays. But the really exciting part here at Kaijen is that you can translate this sustainability thought also into a business need by reducing the amount of components, by reducing the overall plastic consumptions and a lot of other activities. Sustainability is important for me. I'm trying to reduce plastic both in private and my professional life. For example, starting with these reusable cups. Sustainability is important to me as a Kai Jenner, as we can show our customers and prospects that with our products and activities, we care about the environment. We only have the single world, and currently we are consuming three times more resources uh, than we should to keep our world sustainable. I feel the urgency that we must change our behavior. Global warming is the biggest threat for all of us. It's a big threat for all the ecosystems. And we need to act now. I'm happy that we implemented the Volunteer Day last year at Kaijin globally. So if I'm not wrong, we have more than 6,000 employees. And um, that would mean we have more than 6,000 days per year, which we could spend um, as Kaijiners for community work, for the environment, and for sustainability like today. I think it's getting more important for everyone on this planet because we have big problems to tackle and I want to be a part in this problem solving. Sustainability is a topic which is particularly important for me um, because it can help to improve the public health. By reducing the pollution, um, the environmental pollution, and uh, by preserving natural resources, we can make a positive impact on a series of diseases such as respiratory diseases, heart diseases and also cancer. It's up to us now to invest into green energy and to reduce the emissions. So, in fact, to leave an intact environment to the future generations. It's our responsibility. This is really engaging and stimulating, isn't it? I mean, yes. the level of engagement and also I think that's the most important thing at the fundament is the mindset, the awareness of the whole topic and how easily we can integrate it in our daily lives, right? I totally agree. Thank you all, by the way. Now, we would like to involve also you. First of all, please, if you are having any questions, you can make use of the chat function on the right-hand side of your screen and ask questions which are coming up during watching the videos, for example. We have people behind the scenes um, trying to answer those questions in real time. And additionally, we would like to involve you now with a question. Speaking about energizing and energy, you have also heard that Mrs. Helmut Kleinschmidt said that um, yeah, the consumption of freezers is uh, having a huge impact. And we would like to hear from you what you think how much a freezer consumes per day. So please have a look at the poll and um, let us know if you think that one freezer consumes per day rather five to seven kilowatt hours per day, 10 to 15 or 20 to 30. 
It'll be interesting to see the results. I think I have an idea, but I don't know if I'm right. So we will see. As long as we are waiting now mm -hmm. for the answers, mm -hmm. let's get to our colleague Nathan. Mm -hmm. He has prepared some great tips and tricks for you around sustainable lab practices. So let's have a look at our first part of Eco and Friendly with tips on how to save energy. Today we're going to talk about ultra low temperature freezers which can use 25 to 30 kilowatt hours of electricity per day. That's as much as the average American home. Chilling up your freezer from negative 80 to negative 70 degrees can save up to 30% energy. And to save an extra 10%, clean the coils or replace the filter. Did you know that up to 30% of items in a freezer may be obsolete or non-viable? Save space by cleaning these out and maybe the cost of an additional freezer too. Conducting regular freezer maintenance, such as checking the door seals, ensures that they run efficiently. Lighten the load on your freezer's cooling system by putting them in well-ventilated spaces. It helps to dissipate the heat. Rack systems in high-density storage can maximize space. Store DNA at minus 20. These freezers can save up to 80% energy compared with ultra-low temperature freezers. And last but not least, retire old freezers or turn them off when they're no longer in use. Saying goodbye may be sad, but all good things come to an end. And with that, thanks for chilling with me. See you next time. Wow, I think there are some really simple and really impactful tips we all can follow also in our private lives. Um, now, we um, would like to understand how um, the freezer temperature uh, can impact us already and um, see also what you guessed in the poll. So most of you guessed that 20 to 30 kilowatt hours per day are consumed and that is the right, que uh, that is the right answer. It is as much as the typical four-family home in the US consumes per day, by the way. And I'm alone at the moment because I think my colleague Michael is already in the lab and maybe cleaning up. But in between, a colleague joined me and I would like to welcome Markus Sprenger-Hauselz, Head of Product Development Sample Technologies. And we will now hear from him a bit more about sustainability of our products and in the lab. He has started with sustainability already a long time before I started to work in sustainability. And um, Markus, very warm welcome, first of all, to today's event. Hi, Angel Hi Angelica. Thanks for having me. It's nice to have you. Um, Markus, you spoke about My Green Lab certification. Can you share with the audience a little bit more around this activity? Sure, absolutely. But maybe before I explain the uh, My Green Lab certification process, it probably makes sense to uh, explain a little bit what My Green Lab is. Uh, My Green Lab is a non-profit organization. It's a global program to make lab work uh, more sustainable. Uh, so maybe we can uh, listen to Raj Pati. He's a director of business development at My Green Lab, explaining what My Green Lab mission is all about. My Green Lab's mission is to build a global culture of sustainability in science. Culture change is central to everything we do from awareness and education through to our world leading certification programs. We look to inspire the scientific community to integrate sustainability into everything that they do. It means that whether you're designing your next laboratory experiment or a new product to be used in the lab, sustainability sits alongside quality, safety and performance in driving your approach. For us, culture is not tied to any one person, so it does not get lost when a person changes job role or leaves an organisation. Through working towards and achieving our mission, we're looking to ensure a world where all science is conducted in a way that benefits the health and well-being of the people and our planet. If you're looking to start your lab sustainability journey, then take a look at the My Green Lab website and maybe start by becoming a My Green Lab ambassador and or signing the Million Advocates for Sustainable Science Pledge. So now let's get back to your question, Angelica. Um, so the My Green Lab certification process works like this. 
Uh, the entire team gets a questionnaire of 175 questions divided into 14 different uh, topics or chapters mm -hmm. spanning your travel behavior, uh, your instrument use, uh, chemistry use, are you using toxic chemistries. Um, um, your entire lab behavior is actually uh, um, so it's challenged. Or pretty broad, right? Right, mm. yeah. And then you get an, uh, an analysis of your team, how your team behaves. Mm -hmm. And uh, derived from this, you will get some ideas of what you can do to improve. It's sometimes simple things like training the people, um, mm -hmm. but it can be also more uh, active things like changing processes or uh, things you, you act in the lab. Mm -hmm. So it still sounds a little bit theoretical. Do you have a couple of more examples to share with us? Sure, absolutely. So it starts with, with simple things like uh, switching off instruments, computers, lights, uh, whenever you don't use it. Um, it can be uh, very different from lab to lab. A chemistry lab, for example, mm -hmm. if they still use a water jet pump or water cooling, uh, that can be replaced. If you have old instruments, uh, they can be uh, replaced by uh, more energy uh, efficient instruments. Um, it is uh, waste recycling, for example, pipette uh, tip boxes. We are collecting them and send them back to the vendors. Mm -hmm. um, and at the end, it's a, a pretty broad range of, of, of things. Um, I forgot to mention, after, after you have implemented all these changes, um, then you are re going again through this questionnaire round and do a second evaluation. Um, and uh, then you get your final uh, Migreen Lab certification level, starting from bronze, silver, gold, platinum, and the highest level is green. So there's really, really a lot we can do, right? We just have to be aware of it. Um, Markus, when we spoke earlier, you also spoke about the freezer challenge. Can you share a little bit more around this challenge? Yeah, absolutely. So that is also organized by My Green Lab organization every year um, in 2022 and also this year we are participating and it's basically uh, all the little things we just learned from, from Nathan, uh, starting with cleaning uh, the freezers, uh, also vacuuming the coils at the back, uh, make sure you have an active uh, inventory list and throw away stuff you don't need. Mm -hmm. By this you can actually maybe get rid of one uh, freezer uh, to, to condense a little bit your, your storage space. If you still have empty space, fill it with uh, cold packs of, uh, or um, any, any material uh, that also saves energy. Um, and yeah, so at the end it's a, a, a concert of activities done in, in parallel uh, with the help of the entire team. Mm -hmm. And um, for example in 2022 uh, the whole uh, freezer challenge helped to save 9.5 million kilowatt hours. Uh, that's an amazing number. And even our small team with 30 people, we managed to save 30,000 kilowatt hours. Yeah, I mean, especially we just heard how much a um, freezer consumes, so, and we have a little bit of a comparison, so this is really an impressive number. And um, listening to you, isn't that also a lot of work? It is, but it's, uh, it's doable. It's, uh, it's not so much as it sounds because you, um, you should do it anyway from time to time, but many people are just uh, don't do it as regular as they should. Okay, so it's time, I think, for a big thanks, right, um, from my end um, in my sustainability role. And also big thanks to the team who did at the end all the work in the lab. Yeah, great accomplishment, accomplishments. Um, now we will come to another department and Marcus will still stay with me. It has another material input. It's a bit of a higher input than an in R&D um, or throughput. And we are speaking about our colleagues of operations. They are also very creative and we would like to have a look at which, with which ideas they come up, came up. Here at Kayagen, we will increase the sustainability awareness of our employees. Therefore, we are setting up an educational program focusing on employee training. This is done in collaboration with My Green Lab, a non-profit organization focusing on lab sustainability. I hope to see most of you there. In our cell culture lab, 
we replace the single-use plastic pipettes by these glass pipettes. The pipettes can be cleaned, sterilized and reused. In this way we can avoid so much plastic trash in the lab. We found a way to save tons of single-use plastic overshoes in our uncritical manufacturing areas here at Hilden. A way to reduce plastic waste at our sites. Reducing plastic is one of our key goals in our packaging concept. A few years ago, Kyogen team, we are looking for alternative solution to replacing our styrofoam packaging. We found a company in Germany called Landpack. Um, their packing concept made from raw straws convinced us to use for our product. During a two-year phase, we convert exactly everything what is styrofoam to our new Landpack boxes. The interesting part is the Landpack straw panels use only 2% of their energy comparable to the EPS styrofoam boxes. Landpack offers meanwhile a lot of box sizes which fits to our Kyogen product and make the customer also happy that we're using the right packaging for the right product. Since November 22, we are using a new technology for our winding foils in Hilden Logistics. So this new technology is able to pre-stretch the foil from 1 meter up to 2 meter 50 by using the same amount of foil. Since implementation of the new technology, we wrapped already 10,000 pellets. Per pellet, you save 200 grams of plastic, what makes at the end two tons. So this is what we used before, and this little one is what we use now. Another achieve to reduce plastic for Kyogen is that Kyogen used the paper filling since 2022 instead of the bubble foil for our shipments in the cartons. And I think this is also a very important step to be more sustainable. We are also reduce our CO2 emissions by using this double deck truck we can double up our capacity from 30 pallets up to 60 pallets and reduce one truck per day, what makes 30%. What I like most is all the fun they have. It's the basis for being creative. But now I feel, to be honest, a little bit overwhelmed here with all the plastics on the table. But luckily, you just saw in the video that a lot was already or is already mitigated. The styrofoam packages with the straw-based packages, the overshoes get recycled, uh, the bubble wrap paper gets replaced by, uh, the, the plastic gets replaced by paper. So there, there is a lot already going on. But it's just the beginning. Now we would like to hear from you if you have already implemented any sustainability measures and specifically we are interested in hearing from you in the poll if you are already using bio-based materials, products, for example um, being based on cooking oil. So um, if you have a look at the poll you will see the questions A, B, C. We would like to understand if you think it's a good idea to use them, if you rather um, feel not comfortable using these materials in the lab, or if you um, think it's a good idea and you will consider. And the answers are coming already, Markus. So maybe while we're waiting for uh, the answers, uh, I, I cannot agree more. I think we can be as creative as we want. Um, we still will at the end use some polymer-based material, but it's very important uh, to challenge each other and, and really think twice, is it really important to have plastic here? Can it be reduced? Um, or is there a, a different alternative, a different material? So that's why I feel especially this, uh, Paul, is very interesting. Correct. And let's so let's, let's have a look at the idea. Yeah, and it's, I think it's uh, uh, 71, 72 percent uh, think already it's a good idea and I will consider it. There is a few already, 20% are already using it, so I think wow. that's, that's a good start. Yes. And still there is a minority of people not feeling comfortable, so that might also be uh, a challenge or a task for us 
to yeah. explain a little bit more about the safety of these products. Yeah, I think it's our homework as um, a provider of these materials, right? Absolutely, yeah. So we take that on. Yeah. <laughs> so now we have um, heard about how far you are in the adoption to uh, use um, bio-based material or um, uh, alternative uh, source mm -hmm. material. Um, now let us tell you how far we are uh, in uh, adopting these technologies and what our team has developed recently. Thank you, Markus, and thanks for joining. It was a pleasure to speak with you as always. See you soon. Thanks, Angelica. I think we switch over now to Michael and Inga to the lab. We right? will hear from Michael and Inga in the lab, exactly. All right, welcome back. We're, uh, we're in the laboratory now, and now, not just as mentioned by Gedeck in the beginning, we're not cleaning up the lab, and we're also not in a home shopping channel, although it may look like this way. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome Inga Erle here today. Um, Hi, Michael. Inga, tell us who you are. Yeah, I'm the global product and marketing manager here at Kyogen for the Kaya Wave product line. Right, that's great. And before we dive into the product lines, I mean, we already heard reducing things, re um, repurposing plastics, trying to switch to other materials. But I think this is one thing. The other thing is how do you take this information and try to bring it into you know, a reconceptualization of the products you have. So really rethinking the products using these materials. And as you already mentioned, we have this product uh, line Kaya Wave. So tell us about Kaya Wave. Yeah, the Kaya Wave product line is um, eco-friendlier versions of our standard and very popular sample extraction kits, mm -hmm. like the RNA, uh, RNAZ mini kit, the DNA -Z blood and tissue kit, and the Kaya Prep Spin Mini Prep kit. And I brought one example here, that's the RNAZ mini kit and its eco-friendlier counterpart, the Kaya Wave kit. And yeah, as you can see, they differ significantly in size. So how does it actually differ? Tell us what are the different things we changed and switched to. Yeah, so we uh, conducted multiple um, dematerialization efforts. Mm -hmm. um, first, I would like to highlight where they don't differ. So the chemistry and the technology for the sample extraction is 100% the same. So performance and yield is totally comparable. However, we've significantly reduced the number of components. Both boxes contain um, enough uh, consumables for 250 reactions. However, um, we changed here and there to make them a lot smaller. For example, um, the spin columns are no longer packed in these blist uh, blisters that yeah, consume a lot of plastics, but rather put in bags. We also have selected buffers uh, provided as concentrates rather than the reconstituted buffer. And customers can just pour the concentrate into a glass bottle, add ethanol or water, give it a mix, and then it's ready to be used for all the 250 included extractions. I mean, that's significant and very obvious differences here. Um, one may ask, okay, pretty easy. You just take the concentrate and put the buffer or the water on, and then you have the same thing. So why don't we switch already to all the other product lines? Because I think you mentioned that in the beginning for us, it's extremely important to ensure that the reproducibility, the quality of the products where thousands of scientists rely on stays the same. So we cannot compromise on these parameters. So there's a lot of testing behind, a lot of uh, evaluation behind and before you can even make this apparently simple switches. So I think that's a very important thing. On the one hand, it's our ideas, it's our thinking, but it's also important to get let's say, independent, third level, you know, judgments, uh, input, right? Absolutely. I mean, of course, we did our own um, calculations. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you switch from the standard kits to Kaya Wave, you can save up to 63% of plastics or 42% mm -hmm. of cardboard. This depends on this kit. However, we, of course, also wanted to have um, confirmation from a prestigious third party that our efforts actually had an impact on the environmental impact. And this is why we reached out to My Green Lab and asked them to provide us with the Act Label audit for the standard kits as well as the corresponding Kaya Wave right. kits. So I think a lot of people already heard about the Act Label. Let's learn a bit more in detail and listen to our colleague Raj. The ACT Ecolabel program exists to enable informed lab procurement in line with working to reduce the environmental impact of laboratory supply chains and therefore organisations that scope through carbon. ACT was conceived to complement our world leading My Green Lab certification program with the mantra that you cannot have a truly green lab without green lab products. 
Manufacturers undertake to act label consumables, chemicals and equipment, and by doing so enable third-party verified communication of product-level sustainability information that follows a life-cycle approach, whilst at the same time pushing and enabling continuous improvement in said products when it comes to the environmental impact reduction. ACTS can be summarised via the acronym that it is. A is about the industry as a whole being accountable for its impact and working to reduce it. C is for consistency, the same standardised and third-party verified approach across different manufacturers and different products. And most importantly, T is for transparency, the full and open disclosure of this information, enabling suppliers and their customers to be on a journey of informed and continuous improvement. Thank you, Raj. I think that was very helpful to get a little bit of understanding of the background of this whole thing. So that means we got the certification or we got certified using the ACT label? Yes, we are very happy that we received the ACT label for the standard kits as well as the Kaya Wave kits. And we received confirmation that the environmental impact of the Kaya Wave kits is indeed much smaller uh, because the score, the environmental impact score on the ACT label um, decreased from 40.1 for the R and Easy Mini Kit to 25.1, so very significantly. And the lower the value, the lower the environmental impact, of course. So we're are very proud and we hope that um, with the ACT labels we can also help our customers to make their informed purchase decisions. Great, thank you. I think this is really an impressive, um, great job. Inga, thank you so much for being with us here today. Uh, Thanks Michael. Uh, for, for your time and talking about further reduce, recycle, etc. Let's get some more eco and friendly tips from our colleague Nathan. This time it's about, you guessed it, plastic consumption. In that tried and true phrase, reduce, reuse, and recycle. Reduce waste by choosing companies that use sustainable packing material. You can also switch from plastic to glassware whenever possible. Pro tip, pick products that reduce waste, like the Kai Wave kit. They use up to 63% less plastic than standard kits, and they're smaller. Look at you, so cute. One thing to keep in mind, recycle use gloves. Who knows what they'll be made into? Watering cans, park benches, the possibilities are endless. Finally, reuse or recycle pipette tip boxes, shipping boxes, and packaging. And with one tiny snap of the fingers, you can change so much. We are back. Great, thank you, magic, right? It definitely <laughs> is. So you are also back. Did you do a little bit clean up in the lab? Obviously not. There was no need to clean the lab up. So all oh good. Great. Thank good. you. We will now get a different perspective from one of our customers, Dr. Bry Wilson. We will hear how Kyogene products helped him to answer questions around coral bleaching. And I promise you will be inspired. Absolutely. I was brought up on Cousteau's voyages by my father when I was much younger, who was a diver himself, and he'd kind of uh, told me these incredible stories of, of diving at reefs around the world. I work in the Chagos Archipelago Marine Protected Area. This is an extraordinarily remote coral reef. In fact, one of the most remote coral reef systems in the world. And one of the reasons this is so interesting is because it's a system where we can study the effects of climate change without the confounding factors of human impacts. Corals are wonderful ancient denizens of the sea. They have representatives from essentially every single kingdom kind of nestled within a, a single kind of coral colony and you've got the, the microbes, the viruses, the bacteria, the archaea, fungi, protists, you have the fish and the shrimp and each one of these brings its own little microbial party to the coral and share these, uh, these, these various organisms so it's an extraordinarily uh, difficult system to work with. By using molecular tools we can actually examine the DNA of these uh, particular organisms and actually tease apart these kind of very complex communities. I've been using Kyogen Gits now for, for a decade or more and, and they have been the market leaders in a lot of the DNA extraction kits that we work with. One of the big issues we have with extracting DNA from environmental samples is the downstream processing. It's the inhibitors, the contaminants that are part of nature 
and the chaos of these samples that, that affect the things that we do downstream. And so uh, corals in particular are a, a major source of concern because they're such a complex mix mash of, of different organisms. The plant and soil kits that Kyogen produce are well equipped to deal with the things that you actually find present within these environmental samples that can actually interfere with this downstream processing. The particular sample that I sent to Kyogen for sequencing was a tricky one to get. Because there aren't many humans diving or even swimming in this part of the world, the sharks are very curious. They're not really uh, posing a problem or a danger, but they do distract you from the issue at hand, which in my case was sampling the Tonella chagius, the world's rarest coral. I then returned to my labs at the University of Oxford and then shipped these out to the Kyogen headquarters in Germany where they extracted the DNA from this particular sample for me and did all of the downstream processing. And that was a blessed relief, to be honest, because these samples are particularly difficult to work with. And these coral samples actually were the first ones that Kyogen had ever processed. When I first got the results back, it was, uh, it was a case of my mind being blown. And it was before I'd even looked into the genomic data. It was the fact that I had this unique opportunity to be the first person on this planet to actually delve into the recipe of life for the world's rarest coral. And it was something that, as a scientist, you dream of an opportunity to be a trailblazer, to do something that nobody else has done. Molecular techniques are particularly important when it comes to looking at the factors that affect corals. Uh, things like climate change factors, things like direct human impacts. If we see certain genes that are related to stress or a a confounding of the immune system or even a proliferation of a particular pathogen which is going to cause a problem, then these are things that we can essentially see well in advance of symptoms of coral stress. And that means we might actually be able to manage and mitigate these factors given time. What a personality. And what an enthusiasm. I would have loved to have him as a professor during my studies. And I'm also glad that our products could help him. Speaking about products. Again, thank you so much. No, I mean, already we shared with you um, some transfer activity we do in order to consider these um, learnings into our sample prep products. But there are obviously more product lines, uh, for example, the PCR product line. And it's a great pleasure for us to have Dirk Schacht with us here today. Dirk Schacht being in charge and the Global Product Marketing Manager for our PCR portfolio. So, very warm welcome. Thank you, Michael and Angelika. Also, very warm welcome from my end. Good Pl to have you here, Dirk. Pl my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dirk, honestly, PCR systems, consumables, assays, it's not really the first product portfolio mm -hmm. coming into my mind when it comes to environmental impact, reducing the ecological footprint. Um, can you share some details with us? Yeah, right. In, indeed, there is one pretty obvious aspect. Um, if you're looking at enzymes, PCR reagents, which is the um, requirement for shipment and storage in frozen conditions, which means mm -hmm. on dry ice shipments or storage at minus 20, maybe even minus 80 degrees, uh, which is um, uh, very energy consuming. Mm -hmm. And if you uh, consider as an example, um, dry ice pretty much is frozen carbon dioxide that we're using and we are shipping that essentially in kilogram amounts, sometimes just with tiny amounts of an enzyme mm -hmm. or a PCR reagent just to ensure that the f storage and freezing chain is not being interrupted. Mm -hmm. And another aspect on the energy side is obviously the storage itself. Let's say in the lab, not only the energy consumption of the freezers, but also for manufacturing, maintaining them, disposing the freezers of the end of the life cycle as an example, uh, that often contain something like toxic um, freezing agents. And additionally, all these aspects have a cost factor inherent, mm -hmm. sure. dry ice, shipment fees and so on, and the energy itself. And finally, also, there is some risk um, that things could uh, break down or deteriorate or even need to be discarded, the product, if not stored properly. Mm -hmm. So I think that's probably one of the major concerns of our customers, that what you can tell from your experience? 
So. Uh, yeah, probably not the major, but a consistent one, which yeah. everybody encounters at some time, particularly right. when uh, freezing storage uh, conditions in the lab, freeze thaw cycles and so right. on, are consistently considered, right. Okay. So um, we have heard also from customers that there is some concern around performance losses. Um, can you share a bit background information here if that is really a concern? Performance loss, um, if, if um, materials are thawing, then obviously this can happen. Some enzymes are more fragile or more prone to deterioration, like reverse transcriptases definitely have more issues with that than the shear tech polymerase, which is much more stable. Mm -hmm. Not only at very high temperatures, but as well at very low temperatures, right. Um, but isn't lyophilization already used? Is it such a new topic or what is different now? Now, lyophilization is one of the topics we are bringing additionally now into the game. So this is one of the major projects in Kyogen that we um, transfer liquid frozen materials into lyophilized materials. And um, by this, obviously, we are impacting on the one hand the utilization of dry ice, the um, waste of packaging during shipment, um, the energy consumption overall and the cost factors associated with that. So this is one major project that we are currently trying to replace or we're working on a project replacing um, liquid reagents into lyophilized reagents. And you're correct, this is something that is already existing in the markets but mainly utilized in industry accounts like people or companies, industry customers of us who are making their own products, closed systems, they are using uh, lyophilized products already since a while very successfully and now we're taking the approach to make this accessible to end users in a kit format mm -hmm. so that um, laboratories can essentially choose if they want to continue using proven frozen storage or if they want to um, use ambient temperature storage reducing their own environmental footprint by that without compromising performance or the efficiency in the lab work. But, but I think that's a very important point. It's not that we leave the customers alone, try this out. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of R&D work ongoing in order mm -hmm. to make sure that this lyophilization doesn't have an impact on the performance, which is absolutely of highest priority for us, right? Yeah. I agree. There are this way now a lot more flexibility. There's a lot more flexibility for our customers, mm -hmm. a lot more options, yep. right? Is there anything more we can do in the PCR? SA universe. Yeah, right. Some of the um, obvious topics you already touched on earlier, plastic, packaging mm -hmm. um, is something, luckily not one of the major issues in the PCR environment because kids are small, but still <laughs> obviously things are piling yeah. up there. Mm -hmm. So um, we are trying to replace material if possible, reduce material. One example is in the context of lyophilization, glass vials are proven to be used already for systems like ELISA's in the laboratories. Um, then additionally, things like these hidden troublemakers, uh, chemical components which are utilized in PCR reagents mm -hmm. um, is something that sometimes turn out to be unenvironmentally even toxic. So obviously mm -hmm. we try to avoid them from the beginning. If we are using them, um, we try to find replacements for that or at least reducing them because that is definitely a contribution by reducing the consumption of um, non-environmental um, material. So everything helps somewhat. Mm -hmm. And maybe to add this on a personal note, the, the researchers in Kyogen, most of them are chemists, biologists that naturally have an empathy for the environment anyhow. So for the teams over here, um, developing or offering more environmental products to the researcher community out there is a huge motivation indeed. This is also what I'm seeing when I'm right. speaking with our colleagues. Thank you very much, Dirk. I'm really looking forward to your next activities. So let's sure. stay tuned. Thanks for being with us. Thank you for Thank having you. me here. But we are still not at the end, right, Michael? So we will get more tips and tricks from our sustainability specialist, Nathan. And he will now focus on how to manage equipment more efficiently. Enjoy. Hey everybody, I'm back again with more easy tips, and this time it's about lab equipment. Turn off your stuff when it's not in use. It may seem obvious, but it saves energy and helps your equipment last longer. Plug load, what is it? It just means how many things you have plugged into the wall. Plug load accounts for 20% of energy 
consumed in lab. An easy way to reduce plug load is just unplug stuff that's not in use. Reducing plug load by just 10% in all labs in the United States would be like taking 650,000 cars off the road. Just imagine. Here's another idea. Using outlet timers or smart plugs can help shut equipment off automatically, which can save up to 50% energy in lab and reduce the risk of the fire. Remember to put autoclaves in standby mode and only run when full. That's the most efficient way to do it. Be your dad and turn off the lights, especially on nights and weekends. A single open hood can use as much energy as 3.5 ohms. So close the sashes when you're not using them. If possible, share equipment with other labs and unplug the unused devices. Spread the word and talk to your colleagues about these easy tips for a more sustainable lab. See you next time. Great, another set of good ideas and tips. So we're not switching the lights off yet, but we are slowly but surely approaching the end. So um, one thing in between, uh, there's something really great happening. We are receiving so, so, so many questions and our team is really working hard to try to get and answer all these questions. We probably will not be able to manage that within the time frame of that format, but be assured we will have follow-ups and we will continue to answer your questions. So I think that's very important. The other thing we want to look into the Paul from the beginning, right? I mean, exactly. I'm so, curious to see what's going Same here. So let's have a look what the result is. So, yeah, that's interesting. So a lot of things. Um, plastic reduction, reuse, plastic waste, waste reduction, etc. So I, I think there are a lot of things. And it's pretty obvious that the, the focus is around plastics, right? And we do the right thing. Yes, indeed, <laughs> indeed, indeed. So we focus as well on plastic reduction and just should continue. Yeah, absolutely, I agree. I completely agree. So, as I said, we're already approaching the end. Um, I think this was a very impressive uh, thing here. Um, we got so many ideas, we got so many things we can consider. I think for me, if there's one thing to learn is, it's, there's not that one magic bullet. It's the combination of all these little things we can mm. all do together, uh, which make up something bigger here. Uh, Michael, right? do you think we do enough? We, we never do enough, but uh, I think it's better than doing nothing, uh, taking all these little steps, um, putting them together, and then they will have an impact. But most important, I think it's our all mindset and the awareness which we have to have in order to have that impact. Having this said, um, I hope we were able to also stimulate some thinking at your side. Um, we're approaching the end of the show, and um, also want to already highlight the next upcoming Curious Format, which will deal with a very interesting topic, the hidden world around us. We're talking about microbes, mm -hmm. um, so that would be interesting as well. I want to thank the whole team, everybody involved here, to make this possible. I want to thank you for participating and joining. <coughs> so stay safe and goodbye. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.